Hey folks, Steve here with another End of Empire video for you today, and we will be playing through Queen Anne's War in this video. My intention is to follow the same format as my previous video that had covered basically the game introduction and King William's War, uh, but this being Queen Anne's War. Now this is uh, another scenario that is available on Consim World. The PDF that is in a header is called Even More post-publication scenarios. So in addition to all these scenarios that come with the game, <clears throat> these are uh, available as a PDF. There are counter sheets that were created, dedicated to these scenarios, but they were never uh, professionally printed um, and die cut. And so you have to, if you want to play these scenarios, make your own counters. Uh, I have done that. So very similar to the last video, you can see I've got some that I, I had printed out the counter sheets on Avery, or Avery brand sticker paper and uh, fixed them to some spare counters that uh, I've had laying around. I had done this some time ago, uh, and it works pretty good. I, they, they all came out uh, pretty reasonable um, and good-looking counters at that, so yay. Uh, so, <laughs> but you can kind of see where uh, some of the white uh, shows from the stickers not being 100%. Uh, on top of, you know, lined up perfectly, I guess. So anyway, um, so you can check out these post-publication scenarios. You can print out your own counters. There are other uh, publication scenarios, post-publication scenarios, however you want to look at that, uh, that were published in Paper Wars issue 86. Um, that issue of Paper Wars has a number of variant scenarios included for the game uh, and additional counters to support uh, those scenarios. So that's another thing you can look at in addition, again, to the broad set of scenarios that come with the game. Um, this is uh, the sort of next chronological conflict that I want to cover that this game system uh, and set of scenarios across all the publications includes. And um, so, you know, we move forward in time a little bit. So the last uh, video that we did was for King William's War, which is from 1688 to 1697. This is uh, Queen Anne's War, which is basically the North American theater of the European War of Spanish Succession. And so, you know, I just to plug, you know, there's a game called No Peace Without Spain from Compass Games that uh, if I had more wherewithal, I'd play that alongside just for funs and grins. But um, I'm just going to play this. I think this is game enough. Uh, so the interesting thing is, in the post-publication scenarios that were published, Queen Anne's War can be played in separate theaters or as one combined scenario. So there's a Queen Anne's War South, there's a Queen Anne's War uh, North, and it differentiates from the King William's War scenario in that uh, basically we are going to use the other map that the game includes. So uh, that is... Let's see if I can... Show you. So here's the south map. You can see we've got some of Louisiana, right? Florida, these different areas. This scenario has a sort of border. So you can see I'm using my bingo chits. All of these hexes would be civilized or cultivated, um, I should say. I think that's the word. Well, they use the word civilized, but cultivated seems more right to me. Um, the cultivated spaces are covered because they are considered wilderness as opposed to the cultivated terrain. And then uh, from hex row 40, uh, 43 and north is out of play. So I'm putting my special turn track that I made specific for this scenario uh, to lay over to kind of help separate things. But uh, you can see the British control uh, Charleston or Charlestown at this point. Um, and then a few scattering Spanish units and a French unit. Um, and then we have the rest of the northern uh, map, which is set up very, very similar to the King William's War scenario. One special thing is um, there's space down here. This is all largely out of play, uh, and New York is out of play into, until a certain turn, and we'll talk about that here a little bit. Some similarities in this scenario uh, is that there are these militia outpost counters that represent uh, places that eventually, in, in many cases, became true outposts or towns 
or would become cultivated civilized areas of colonies, but are represented by just these really basic outposts. So these are units that don't move. They're just to have a very basic garrison that will easily be uh, defeated and eliminated if an opponent can get into the hex usually. Um, so let's, let's talk a little bit of context here. Um, we'll talk about the south uh, aspects first, since it's easier to describe. I'm going to read from the scenario information so we can get a little bit of... I'm going to try to center the map on this stuff, because technically Louisiana doesn't really play into the scenario. Um, Queen Anne's War, 1702 to 1713, as the North American theater of the Span War of Spanish Succession uh, was known in the British colonies... Uh, was the second in a series of French and Indian wars fought between France and England in North America for control of the continent. The War of the Spanish Succession was primarily fought in Europe. In addition to the two main combatants, the war also involved numerous Native American tribes allied with each nation in Spain, which was allied with France. Spanish Florida and the English province of Carolina, right, uh, were each subjected to attacks from the other, and the English engaged the French based at Mobile in what was essentially a proxy war involving primarily allied Indians on both sides. The Southern War, although it did not result in significant territorial changes, had the effect of nearly wiping out the Indian population of Spanish Florida, including parts of present-day southern Georgia, and destroying Spain's network of missions in the area. The Southern map is used. The scenario be begins on turn one, spring 1702, and ends after turn 64, uh, fall 1712. Now again, the, the scenario information advises to use the existing game turn tracks and to wrap things around, but I find that kind of uselessly complicated to do, and it was much easier for me to uh, have this uh, Excel-made uh, turn track that uh, is just a little easier for me to read, and I can do that by year, and it, it works pretty good. And you can see I've got the reinforcements. Now, this is reinforcements for both the southern and the northern campaigns. And what's interesting about this is that you're basically playing two different campaigns at the same time with very minimal crossover. There is some possibility for the Spanish fleet to come north, but only if uh, the French and the Spanish have taken Charleston. So... Um, it's almost like I'm just playing two different scenarios at the same time, but they are conjoined uh, for our purposes. Um, and so we'll kind of steer things to the north, and we'll talk about the, uh, the North Theater for a second. And just in commenting on these Native American units up here, that, that's my available box. The game doesn't actually have one on map that I can see. Uh, so I use that as my available Native American units because you're never going to have units that far out. Just easier that way. Um, okay, so for the Northern Theater, um, it's going to sound very similar. Uh, let's see, I'll skip to some new sentences for the description. The War of the... Uh, yeah, okay. In addition to the main combatants, the war also involved numerous Native American tribes allied with each nation, and Spain, which was allied with France. The Iroquois remained neutral. So it, you'll see as we get to playing the scenario that in the Northern Theater, the British do not have their Iroquois allies available to them at all. And in fact, these uh, four uh, Native American units that are uh, up here are all actually for the Southern Theater, not the Northern Theater. So that's kind of a change up from King William's War. The English colonies of New England fought with French and Indian forces based in Acadia and Canada. Quebec City was repeatedly targeted but never successfully reached by British ex expeditions and the Acadian capital, Port Royal, was taken in 1710. The French and Wabanaki uh, Confederacy sought to thwart New England expansion into Acadia, whose border uh, New France defined as the Kennebec River in southern Maine. Toward this end, they executed raids against targets in Massachusetts, including present-day Maine, most famously raiding Deerfield in 1704. The North Map is used, uh, begins on... Turn one, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so relatively straightforward stuff. Um, let's talk about the special roles that are going to pertain. So uh, just like King William's War from the previous video, we have a lot more wilderness. We talked about the outposts and the forts uh, and kind of how they're situated. The Native Americans, uh, their ability to be recruited is pretty much the same. Basically, every turn, 
uh, we're going to look at these units up here and we're going to roll a die. If we roll a one, then that side gets that uh, particular unit. What I tend to do is I just go and I roll, you know, first guy roll a die, second guy roll a die, third guy roll a die, and, and then distribute if we roll the one. It's pretty straightforward. Um, in terms of the victory conditions, so important. Because we're playing two campaigns at once, there is sort of a conjoined victory condition assessment. But the British player will win an immediate decisive victory if he simultaneously controls uh, Quebec and Port Royal and has eliminated all four outposts slash militia units on the south map. So, um, you know, Quebec, Port Royal, and then down here, they're talking about Mobile, Pensacola, uh, what will eventually be known as St. Mark's, but is not called that at this point, and then St. Augustine. So those four are the four. So it kind of means like a total, total victory across the map. Um, and then comparatively, the French player, French Spanish player, wins an immediate decisive victory the instant he controls Boston and Charlestown. Um, very similar to the King Williams War, uh, Boston has a very strong militia unit holding it under a fort, so it is highly unlikely that that is going to occur. Um, otherwise, because this is going to be the more important thing for tracking victory, the player who has the most outpost militia units on the map at game end is the winner. Boston and Carolina militia are not considered outposts for this rule, so Charleston doesn't, it doesn't count. We need to hold Charleston as the British, but it won't give us victory points. Um, but uh, it will be important for the British to deprive the French and the Spanish of their southern outposts. And then uh, up here, very similar to King William's War, we want to be eliminating uh, enemy outposts and maintaining our own. So in, again, similar to King William's War, there's definitely a similar, uh, what I expect to be a very similar push and pull around the control of outposts uh, with the addition of the southern map and a different reinforcement schedule. Uh, we should expect to see things just be a little bit different uh, this time around. Uh, as, it relates to, uh, as it relates to replacements, it's going to be the same as King William's War. The French may replace one Marine, uh, Marine de Quebec step each spring uh, turn in Montreal and in Quebec. So they get a little bit of provincial recruitment. Um, the British will not get any replacements, but they're going to have a greater reliance on the provincial units that come onto the map every spring and then retire uh, in the winter to go home. So that much will still be the same in this scenario. For fleets, the Spanish fleet will be available on a roll of one each turn starting on turn 26. Um, so that is eh, half, a, little, a little less than halfway through the game. Um, it is restricted to the south map unless the Spanish control all three of their ports on the south map and Charleston. The British fleet is available on the north map on a roll of one each spring, summer, or fall turn. There is no naval infantry. That was sort of a, a missed opportunity in King William's War. The French had some naval infantry that I never really used. Um, and then... Uh, Louisburg is still not in existence yet, so nothing blocks the British from potentially parking their fleet in the, uh, the Gulf of St. Lawrence up here uh, to cause some issues to the French during uh, the winter blockade season. There's one very important rule, uh, special rule thing that's going to come for reinforcements, which is that there's something called Walker's Expedition. So there's a huge stack of British regulars and a leader that can uh, come into the game on turn 55 or later. So turn 55 is pretty late, right? It looked pretty late in the war, but there you go. Um, if the British fleet conducts an amphibious invasion in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, you roll a die. If you roll a 1 of 3, so a 50% chance, you permanently withdraw the British fleet and all units on board uh, at the time. The turn 55 British reinforcements may only be entered aboard the British fleet while making an invasion in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Their entry may be delayed indefinitely. So what that really means is we've got this really big stack of guys here. Very powerful. 
but they can only come onto the board starting on turn 55. We can say when we're going to do this, and we're going to put the fleet in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. We're going to say, hey, we're doing an invasion, um, and historically this represents an expedition to Quebec. But we'd roll a die, and if that die came up, say a three, uh, this all goes away and the invasion doesn't occur, which is actually the historical situation. There was this big expedition, uh, but something went wrong as they were sailing through here, and the ships all got dashed on rocks and ran aground and a bunch of craziness, and it was a total disaster for the British. So this game gives you the opportunity to see if that expedition had not failed so spectacularly, but it's a 50-50 chance and it's pretty late in the game. So I'll be very curious to see you know, what effect that is. It would be kind of a bummer if that late in the game and maybe the French and Spanish are going to win, but then you get the ahistorical, like that army arrives and then totally flips the game because they capture Quebec. That would be kind of a bummer, I guess, if you're the Spanish-French player, but I'm playing solitaire, so it doesn't, doesn't matter too much. And then one final important thing, and this relates to uh, New York and these two hexes right here. Units may not enter New York civilized hexes, including those uh, not considered civilized, until turn 43. So you can't enter these hexes here or even down here until turn 43. Units may not enter civilized hexes in Pennsylvania. And uh, we talked about the South already a little bit. But just so, so the, what, what is going on with that is that there was um, basically the colony of New York was wanted to be neutral in this conflict. They wanted to stay out of it. There were some trade agreements uh, with the French, I think, that were kind of related to that. So the French were not willing to go into New York. And New York did not want to lend itself to fight the French because of those ties. But uh, in uh, the spring of 1709, um, some of that changed. And that's when, on the same turn that units can enter New York, there is a whole stack of reinforcements that come in in Albany. Um, not all of these are going to go to Albany, but there's a couple of them that will go into Albany. Um, several units uh, that will show up there. Um, and we'll, you know, when the time comes, we'll, we'll talk through that. <clears throat> Once they enter, then New York is free game. And one of the things I'm going to have to be careful of, or I'm going to have to make a decision, I talked last video about these supply hexes that are covered by my bingo chits, uh, that I've chosen not to treat them as supply hexes. Um, because the convention of the game seems to be ordinarily uh, that supply hexes are in cultivated civilized hexes, uh, given that those are not, and we're supposed to be treating these as wilderness, um, I have chosen to ignore the supply hexes for the British here. So they are reliant on overseas supply or counting to other civilized hexes that are in uh, <coughs> friendly territory. The, so the one thing that then matters is can British units trace supply uh, through New York down the Hudson? Um, and I think generally speaking, uh, I do not want to allow them to do that. I think that's my stance. It won't really matter because there's not enough British units to actually bother heading up Lake Champlain to Montreal over here that it would be that big a difference. But once that expedition comes out of New York, that's when it's more reasonable. So to me, I think what I'm going to do as my own house rule, because the rules don't really cover this very well, I'm going to treat even the uh, supply path through neutral New York as not usable until turn 43. And we'll, we'll see how that works. If it ends up being a really weird constraint, then I'll rethink it. But just based on the logic of the situation and how I interpret that, I think this makes the most sense. So really, at the beginning of this scenario in the north, the French are going to be, op or the British rather, are going to be operating uh, through here and along here uh, with with their primary uh, units of, of greatest strength being uh, good old Church, who's a ranger, and he doesn't care about supply tracing anyway. So I think we'll be okay with that. So 
All right, really long intro, guys, uh, as usual. That's how I roll. But I wanted to make sure you guys saw the context of the scenario before I got started in earnest on it. Um, and so what I'll do is I will, uh, I think for this video, just to keep it shorter, I'm going to check in every two years. So on, so we're starting on spring 1702. I will show the results of the first two years, so effectively the first 12 turns of the game, uh, and return at the start of the spring turn of 1704. There will technically be a winter turn for that year that I play through, but it doesn't to me it doesn't make sense to show the map until after the winter has ended and we're about to start a new campaign season that year. So okay, we will we will see you guys in the spring of 1704. We'll see what progress has been made on the board at that point. Okay, hey guys, here we are at spring 1704, and uh, yeah, things are very interesting, very uh, two lopsided situations. So in the north, um, as you can see, the French came down from the north and just in dramatic display destroyed every single outpost of the British uh, on the coast there um, and have left the... Uh, uh, oh gosh, the uh, Kaunawaga Indians behind in this hex of Boston. And I, I it's, this is going to be one of those weird things to interpret. So I set up the Massachusetts militia as being under the fort, being like in the fort of Boston. And they don't have a movement factor. So it, it seems like they can't, come out of they I, I don't know what to do here because here, here's the weird situation I'm trying to understand in terms of movement um, So here, here's the here's the question. This is the rules, I guess, question that matters here. That I left the Native American unit behind because Church is supposed to enter this turn in hex thirty one twenty, right? And he is a very dangerous unit, powerful. Could shift the tide for the British, but this is the hex he's supposed to come in. In a town, a city, in a hex is a hex within a hex. And it says hex 3120. So I expect he needs to be in the hex, but the hex is currently occupied by an enemy unit, these Native Americans, with a linear combat factor of one, which means they can't actually fight in linear combat if they have to, which is why they're down here and they don't care about supply. They're actually the best unit suited for this to sit on top of the city of Boston. Now, he, here's the thing. If, it's, if that unit is there... The the other unit, the church unit, can't come in. It does not have a boxed entry hex. It can't enter. The enemy is occupying that space, disrupting, we'll say, the ability for the church expeditionary group to form. But then what happens? Is Boston now eternally uh, surrounded by these uh, Indian units, and we will never see church enter the game? That doesn't feel right. And as I try to interpret the rules, the, the one thing I'll call out here is we see that the very powerful militia here is a zero movement unit. And I started him inside the fort so that he, it could be fortified um, just to, to make sure that there's no chance that anyone's going to come in and, and take Boston. But that was kind of foolish, because when they're fortified, uh, and they're in, they're in the fortification, they're in the city hex instead of the hex itself. Um, so maybe that was a mistake. And so how do you get out of this? Well, I think for reinforcement purposes, it means we're going to have to wait for church to come in until next turn. Um, I think. 
but rule 9.2 in the rules notes that there's minimum minimum movement ability we can always move one hex assuming the unit activates so now that we're out of winter and it's possible to activate this militia by itself I think the rules are such that if that unit can activate, I can move one hex and exit the fortification into the hex surrounding Boston and engage that Native American unit with the militia. I think, I think, I think, I think that that is the case. I believe I'm going to be able to do that. And this is not a wilderness hex, which means we don't need to worry about ambush. So I believe I'm going to be able to do it but the fact that the French have masked this means, you know, it's not going to... We're basically at the mercy of the activation dice to get that unit out of there. Otherwise, the Mi'kmaq uh, Indians are supporting defense of Port Royal. What's interesting is in this scenario, Port Royal has a fortification. So it is, it is relatively strong in terms of the actual units that are there to protect it. It's not going to be easy for the British to kind of sneak in and nab it. And now we have some wilderness protection in the form of those uh, Native American uh, folks defending in the woods. The French, after they had destroyed all of this, were very wary of the supply situation over winter and so moved back. Uh, they really all went through here, but then over the winter turns, via some activations, they uh, kind of moved up around for better positioning. Um, so very generally, the last two years have been really good for the French in the Northern Theater. They've accomplished a great many goals. They have pinned the British, uh, hemmed them in to great effect. And when we start the spring, these stacks are going to come back south again um, to kind of maintain control. And as we get close to fall, they'll drift back again to these rivers that come off the St. Lawrence. So that's kind of the, the yo-yoing of the French in this scenario is that they can come down uh, you know, out of supply, disrupt the British, and then they need to make sure they try to retreat back into uh, a good supply uh, situation. And that's just going to be the tricky thing. It's not a big deal if they're down here on the coast and the British fleet is not in, but that one in six chance on a fall turn, you know, you could find yourself, uh, you know, in a bad position for supply. Um, so that's the that's the North Theater, but in the South Theater, the British are doing extraordinarily well. Uh, they've gotten very lucky with their uh, allied native tribe uh, die rolls and have activated a lot. The French uh, space in Mobile was destroyed. Uh, yeah, the French Mobile, the Spanish Pensacola was destroyed. Um, and they nearly got to St. Mark's here, but the, uh, the Spanish allied, uh, tribe managed to kind of get in here before they could be attacked. And basically, uh, some of the allied tribes got knocked off the board. Um, so this outpost is safe for the moment, but it remains under threat. Um, just having the wilderness defense here is what's really important in protecting this space. This French allied Native American unit is trying to do something, but at this point it's really tough. What we need to make sure is we protect this because the Spanish and the French need a place for reinforcements in a couple years. Um, otherwise, uh, our guy Moore here has traveled along the coast and via a vicious combat that went their way, they took St. Augustine and destroyed uh, that outpost and are basically hanging out here with sea supply. Um, and we managed, we did uh, lose this tribe in the uh, the Yam, this is the Yamasi, uh, but they came back because we got lucky die rolls. So um, the only thing kind of keeping the southern front in play is this location. Uh, the French and the Spanish are due for reinforcements all the way out in turn 26, which is in 1706. Uh, which is two years from now. So whether or not they can survive that long, I don't know. I don't know what happens when they lose 
you know, can the French and the Spanish arrive anywhere? That I'm not sure about. I'll have to look into that. You know, can they can they do a naval invasion somewhere and then rebuild these outposts? I think that they can. Um, so I think what I would want to do is get it such that uh, I need to get the British Native American allies on the board and I need, and I'm moving this guy down to do this, occupy the hex, and then it's pretty much bottled up and it's going to be really hard for the French and the Spanish to come back in. So if they seal all of that up and, and one front's locked down, uh, even if it's not an auto victory, it's going to put the British in a really strong position for victory point count. Um, but they're going to have to make up for the disaster in the north. So there you go. Um, okay, so we're gonna. I'm going to continue to play through from here in 1704, spring 1704. Uh, I will come back in the spring of 1706, and we'll see uh, where things have progressed at that point. Okay, here we are in the spring of 1706, and not a whole lot has changed, I guess. I mean, the church has entered the the field, so I, I just I did go ahead with that idea that. The militia should be allowed to move a hex, which in this case means from out of the town till from from inside Boston to outside Boston. And they did scatter the Native American units in linear combat. Um, though looking at the combat table, it's like there's a pretty good chance that we could fail that role. Um, so I'm lucky that it didn't. I'm not sure how that works. Um, so maybe we're already looking at a very near, you know. French, maybe what should have been a French victory automatically at some point along the line, uh, but I, you know, we're playing through it. So Church had come back. There was some fighting around here. Um, Church ended up being defeated. He has now come back. Um, you know, where they, he had rebuilt some of these outposts. He's lost some. Uh, this stack actually lost some units due to attrition because they were here during a winter turn. Uh, and so while there are Native Americans in the stack that eventually moved here, we did lose one of our uh, French provincial units, uh, though it has come back up here as part of reinforcements. We'll try to get him, you know, down the river line and join his, his friends. Um, but the British are just feeling the crunch of not being able to move the football right now. They've just been knocked back without answer. Maybe this is just due to the French activating a lot and just being able to take out, uh, you know, consistently take out all of those outposts. And, and you know, yeah, that, that's a part of it. Church can definitely, you know, selectively defeat a French stack, but he has to roll reasonably well. And in the combat he had up here uh, against uh, uh, Vaudreuil, he rolled a one. So that wasn't going to work for him, but he can keep coming back every spring. So I guess that's the important thing is that he will never be destroyed. Uh, he can only be off the board for a little bit. Um, so there's that. In the in the south, uh, we've seen, uh, basically, I managed to get uh, tribes down here to occupy these places so that the French and Spanish can't simply land and rebuild those outposts. So that's going to be a problem. Uh, this unit was lost. We got them back, and the Spanish are trying to get this unit over there to try to clear out those spaces because we do have reinforcements coming soon that can land here, potentially. Um, over here, St. Augustine had been lost, and now there's just sort of this kind of stalemated situation where there's only so much activity that can take place. Um, if, basically, if th there's enough... British Native American allies here, that if they can get all of them on the board, they can clear out the French and the Spanish, they could potentially be occupying these locations to keep them from being rebuilt, and then their ambush factor is basically making it impossible for the uh, French and Spanish to come back. So the, the Southern Theater, you know, is definitely in the British favor. You could totally see it wrapped up before long, though on turn 24, the Moor leader dies and he exits, but the Carolina provincial will always come back too. So we've always got some decent uh, provincial power to operate with no matter what. Um, so there you go, guys. So over the next two years of the conflict, we're going to see some French and Spanish regulars as well as the entrance of the Spanish fleet, which, uh, which may prove useful to some degree. 
there will be more British reinforcements next spring in 1707 uh, that will show up for Massachusetts. This will add a little bit more linear combat cap uh, capability, but they really need church to stay safe for ambush purposes. So it's going to be a tricky amount of support there, but at least they get something they can use. You know, church can fight the French while these other infantry units rebuild outposts. That's probably the strategy here. So we'll come back in the spring of 1708, and we'll have seen the, uh, the results of that. Okay, here we are at the spring of 1708, and um, so far things have improved for the British in the north uh, in, in bits. Uh, basically what we had seen was Church did spring forward, and due to sporadic British fleet availability, uh, hit a few of the French outposts out here. I have them flipped rather than just removed so I can remember where they're at uh, without always looking at the hex uh, numbers. So he had come up and, and took those out. Uh, of course, he had to go home in the winters uh, while had uh, activities via the uh, new provincials, Massachusetts provincials that have shown up. They also go home in the winter and refresh in spring, but uh, they were able to help rebuild some of these outposts. Church did as well, basically. But um, So there's been a little bit of a, a gain here and just some challenges with the French um, having been pushed back, trying to get their units um, stacked back together to be able to operate. They did just get uh, another of their um, uh, allies onto the board that should come down and kind of help uh, provide more balanced uh, stacks to contest church and those uh, militia. Um, those militia are actually pretty potent because, I mean, they have linear factors, but their wilderness factor is a two. They can't attack, but they can at least defend. So it makes it a little bit harder to be wiped out by uh, the French and their allies on ambushes. So there's definitely some resiliency coming back to the British force pool here. Um, and now on the spring turn, the British do have their fleet, which means we're probably going to see Church do some uh, raiding up here in Acadia. Uh, up here, maybe even work his way over and start impacting these outposts. And it's really hard in this scenario to get the French uh, back over here to re rebuild these because we don't have uh, a lot of naval capability. Um, and in fact, there is no French fleet in this scenario as opposed to King Williams War where we did. So it's very difficult. They have to march over here to get, get there. Um, we once had this guy who could always activate and i over i i was too risky with him and lost him and there's no way to get him back he i don't think he can take the replacements that the rules allow you to get in montreal and quebec he's a distinct unit um i could maybe house rule that and say well he should be able to to come back but um i'm not sure how to interpret interpret it um because the the rules are specific to uh, Mar de, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, what is it? Troops de Marine Quebec steps can be replaced. It seems like those units specifically and not others. Um, so, you know, had this guy still been around, he could be running around rebuilding outposts, but because he's gone, uh, it's going to be really hard to make that. There are, uh, I do have a couple other units around that could make their way over here, but they're going to be very susceptible uh, to being defeated by church. So it's going to be, it's really tough for them. And then similarly in the South, the South is pretty much done. Um, the British have basically won out almost entirely. They now have uh, their allies on the board. This guy's just working his way down here to occupy that hex. Otherwise, all the important Outposts have been destroyed, and they've been occupied, or nearly all occupied. The last remaining Spanish-French unit on the board in the south is this uh, Choctaw. And they they really can't do a whole lot to change the game situation at this point. Coupled with that, and this is why it's like, to me, it's really the end. Um, there's a set of dead pile stuff over here. You can see my camera stand. 
um, the regulars that came in, I did not do well with these guys. And this Spanish unit was ambushed in the wilderness trying to get to St. Augustine. Um, and then this guy was attacked in an outpost, ambushed, and because he's got no ambush factors, it was a slaughter. Um, it basically just came down to bad luck. I couldn't activate these guys to meet up with those infantry to give them ambush cover, and uh, I, I, I thought I was reasonably close that I just had to get a few activations, but by the time I could, it was too late, and these guys had already activated. So the, the British were rolling hot dice, and I guess that's ultimately, you know, in this war game, affects a lot if you can activate a lot. And again, the, the deadliness of ambush attack units in the wilderness will rip everything to shreds. So we can almost say that the South Front is over with, uh, Charleston is well protected by the militia, as well as these provincials that come back every spring. There, and there's really no other way to get replacements for those Spanish and French units in the South. So I'm, I'm almost not even, I, I don't think I'm even going to bother to show the South anymore on camera. I think we're going to move this guy down and then, uh, you know, we'll focus on the North. Um, the British still need to be considering how to take Port Royal and Quebec to get an auto victory. But even right now, um, they've got a pretty good uh, lead on the, the the French, I think, at this point, because the, the French have, let's see, one, two, three, six, seven outposts, and the uh, British have six, but they're very likely going to be able to restore a few more and even push the French back. So it's looking like this will probably end up being a, French, or a British victory, but uh, we'll see. So I'll come back. Uh, maybe what I'll do is I'll show, yeah, we'll come back in 1710, spring of 1710. Okay, here we are in the spring of 1710. We are deep in the war and we're headed towards the end with only, uh, a couple of years left. Um, and so far it's been kind of a, a interesting set of operations over the last couple of years. Um, Church has been mighty effective. Uh, he's been helping to rebuild outposts, but he was also headed north and had uh, actually gotten as far as, you know, deep here in Acadia, Nova Scotia, uh, raiding and destroying outposts, and even made uh, a play at Annapolis, though that uh, did not go well for him. He was going to go home anyway in the winter, so... Um, Kind of interesting utility. You can definitely go for a last ditch effort uh, before everyone tries to go home. And uh, they did not not get past the uh, group that was defending here, um, unfortunately. So the uh, the I'm trying to think through. I think these guys should actually have been removed. My bad. Um, anyway, so the uh, attempt here failed. Uh, anyway, the important thing was then that the French, you know, real stack uh, did try to get uh, repairing some of these outposts and coming up here to do the same, uh, though that has given uh, the British an opportunity to consolidate their own situation in rebuilding their outpost. I'll also throw out there that Vaudreuil was uh, captured due to an, an attack by Church uh, earlier on. And um, basically, I uh, need to place my reinforcement here. There's a... Uh, I think I'm putting them in Montreal. Um, the, the, the French are basically on the back foot. So with the Southern Theater pretty much wrapped up in the British favor... Right now, it is all about uh, whether or not the uh, French can win out on the outposts. And right now, the French have, what, eight outposts, I think, is what they have here. Um, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I don't think there's any others that I'm somehow missing. And right now, the French have one, two, three, four, five, uh, six in Annapolis, and then... Uh, depending on how the French can repair, they'll have a little over eight. So there, there's still an element that the British need to go on the offensive, but I think they're in a much better position to do things now. Um, should also throw out that last spring in 1709, 
New York has stopped being neutral. And so uh, we have militia that had started to head up the river, but couldn't get there by themselves. Um, there have been a couple of different attempts at making some offensives, but the British fleet availability for doing extra landing at, at Port Royal or Quebec have not panned out well. Um, the, the British fleet availability is just crap, so they just haven't been able to do much. But uh, what I've structured now is uh, we got, I'm just going to show this whole stack. We have enlistments that are in New York and Albany. And then we also have uh, this uh, British regular unit that came in Albany. And then on turn 49, this turn, we got a uh, Marine reinforcement and where we would want to put that guy. Um, what I decided to do, because we didn't have the fleet availability, he has to go into a friendly port. Um, ooh. I think that maybe maybe I can't put him there. I'll have to look at this. What I wanted to do was get him and the leader Nicholson uh, set up so that we've got an actual strong column to leave Albany and start marching towards Montreal. And that would be kind of a major offensive that if they took Montreal would give them the ability to continue to push towards Three Rivers and then maybe even Quebec via a land connection. They'd be limited by the enlistments that would have to go home in the winter but there's enough British regulars there to uh, maintain strength and still threaten uh, much of the territory of the map, while Church maintains uh, outpost attacks because the, the remaining French stack is really out of position here, and they're going to have to decide between defending the outpost down here, rebuilding, or doing something else. Uh, the lack of a French fleet in this scenario is definitely a major disadvantage for the, uh, the overall situation. So it's it is pretty tricky um, from that perspective. I'm going to have to look to see, so this, you know, overseas reinforcement, can he go all the way into Albany uh, due to it being a navigable river? Um, and I should be able to get an answer here pretty quickly. Um, let's see, reinforcements, overseas reinforcements. Okay, so it does say it has to be a port hex, not... Okay, da, da, da. okay, it has to be a port. Okay, so unfortunately, these units, uh, this guy is going to have to come in. Um, uh, he's not going to be able to go into a navigable river, so I may just have to put him in... New York, just slightly off camera, put them in New York and then have him either join up or have Nicholson come down and pick him up and then bring him up to Albany and then maybe start heading up to more, towards Montreal. But it's going to be a, a useful unit. Um, whoops, I grabbed the, the wrong one. Um, it's this guy. There we go. Okay. So uh, that's a potent unit. Uh, would be very useful to have. Um, alternatively, would have this guy try to attack um, uh, Port Royal, but we don't have the, the British fleet this turn, unfortunately. We'd have to wait till next turn. So I kind of have to pick where I want to go. Do I want to try to hit Annapolis, or you know, do I want to put a lot of effort behind a march to Montreal? And I, I like the idea of trying to get into Montreal because it's going to be really hard for the French to come back and repair them repair those outposts and rebuild them if we were managed to take them at all. Uh, because currently the main French stack is in Acadia, which is pretty far away at this point. Um, they sort of got drawn away trying to repair the damage the church did. And at this point, it kind of feels like the, the French are really just kind of outmaneuvered by the force composition of the British. Um, and they're going to be not able to do much more. So anyway, with that, we'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, we'll come back in the spring of 1712, which would be the final year. Um, so we'll do two more years of activity. Uh, just a reminder that next spring in 1711, we have the Uber stack on turn 55, which we'll have to decide, do we send them to Quebec, which I'm sure we would choose to do that. 
to try to, you know, take out uh, a, another critical zone um, on the game map and hope that the ships don't crash along the rocks like they did historically. Um, all right, we'll come back and talk through what happened. Okay, here we are at spring 1712, the last campaign season yet to occur, but almost certainly going to end up being uh, a British victory. Um, so there was a great uh, series of actions of the French stack, uh, reestablishing control. Um, I guess I, I should put these guys, you know, face down to the note where they go. Um, had swung around, rebuilt outpost and is heading back further south now after ferrying across here to try to get down uh, and, and do something in the last campaign season to try to edge out something of a victory. However, the great uh, massive stack of British regulars um, managed to pass the die roll, so we are now in a historical territory, and landed at Quebec and easily brushed aside the garrison at that outpost and have taken it. Uh, Church, who had taken a northern route now that uh, had support here, had swung up and taken out uh, the Three Rivers outpost. And so now, you know, British or French power is reliant solely on what we have in, uh, uh, in Montreal, uh, which is kind of tricky. <laughs> uh, and technically, I guess, they do get a step reinforcement here. Um, but, uh, yeah, it is interesting. I do get that at least, um, of provincials. So it's sort of the last remnant, uh, in the North for the French. Um, we had, uh, Nicholson here. He had a, a much larger stack. He's got those Marines and then the Indco battalion. Uh, but he had a much larger set of enlisted men with him that were going to make a play for Montreal, but they just couldn't activate enough. And many of those men have gone home for the winter uh, and are now back in Albany, Hartford, Connecticut. And, uh, you know, it, it's going to be a question, does Nicholson try to go back down the river, pick some guys up and come back, or do they make a big play? The one thing is we got to be careful with this big stack. As big as it is, it has no wilderness factors at all. So you might say, well, why don't you just come over and take Montreal with the big stack. Well, there are still enough uh, ambush factors here that would guarantee uh, that you only need the one uh, that would cause a, a great number of step losses and would cause that stack to retreat, and it would be unlikely that they would be able to activate for another attempt, and, and they would just keep bouncing off. They would would need a roll of one on a D6 as the French for that mega stack to be able to get past the ambush factors that are in Montreal, which is why we needed Nicholson's stack, which uh, at least had um, at least had some wilderness combat factors on defense that we could enter the hex, probably survive the ambush combat enough to force some linear combat, weaken the stack, and then that's when we could maybe follow up with this set of guys. So I'm not sure it's going to happen. Um, either way, Church is back as usual, and he's going to do his best to defend these outposts and contest the main French stack that is coming down the coast, only able to be in supply because the British fleet is a no-show uh, a lot of the time. So this final campaign season is going to be really interesting. The, the French are now at, um, just make sure there's not a an outpost right there. Uh, they're at five, six outposts, maybe able to get up to seven, probably not going to get anything in the north back at this point. So, so yeah, six, seven, if they can maybe hold on, they could end the game with seven. Unfortunately, the British have one, two, three, four, They have eight by my count, so um, it, it's conceivable the French could win, but it's going to be a really tight, tight thing, and I severely doubt it's going to end up going to the French. Maybe it'll be a tie. We'll see. 
So we'll come back at the end. There's only really four turns left. The spring, two summer turns, and the final fall turn, which will be the end of the scenario. We'll see where things end up. Okay, here we are at the end of the scenario. Not much happened in these last few turns. Almost everybody had activation problems, um, and Nicholson basically retreated because he was really, really at risk of being ambushed and destroyed. So they pulled back, and um, Church was going to try to make a play here and disrupt the French, but he failed in the attack. Uh, the the um, ambush on the French side rebuffed him before he could bring linear combat to bear, which he probably would have been a bit advantaged at. And so um, this would have opened this up for these guys to come down and wreak some havoc, but they just couldn't get going. And uh, that's the end. So... Um, in terms of tallying the victory, we'll just kind of, you know, get ourselves uh, situated here. Um, the British never took control of Port Royal, so they don't get the automatic victory. Um, and basically nothing occurred for the Spanish and uh, French to get victory. Then it's the player who has the most outpost and militia units on the map. Uh, Boston and Carolina militia are not considered outposts, so, so basically Charleston in Boston don't matter for counting victory points. It's all only about the outposts. The Spanish and the French lost all four of their outposts in the south, so that they were basically having to make up a deficit in the north, basically, or, you know, they missed out on that, that count. For the French remaining, we have Montreal, for one, and then we have... Uh, uh, and come to think of it, probably a couple of these guys probably should have it tritted away, um, leaving one guy behind. But it ended up not mattering um, during winter and stuff like that. But I don't, it ended up not mattering at all. Um, so we have one in Montreal. We've got Port Royal. And so that's two, three, four, five, six, seven. The British, by comparison, they don't have Quebec. Quebec is not an outpost for the British, so they can't build it and get a point. They have uh, these two in New York, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So just by the barest of margins in terms of victory points, despite capturing Quebec, which is a coup uh, for sure, um, despite that, uh, the British win, but by just a sliver, by just a single point, um, do they win? And so, um, I'm trying to think, I think the result of this war, uh, put a lot of Acadia in British hands. I'm trying to remember the historical outcome here. Maybe I'm thinking of King George's war. Um, so I, yeah, I don't know. It, it, it came down to the wire. Um, the British were definitely in a position to win, uh, for a while now, just because of the New York reinforcements that had come in the Uber stack that was going to guarantee them effectiveness somewhere, uh, as long as they could land somewhere properly and, and make some some move. The, the fact that that stack doesn't have any ambush factors at all is really interesting because you could have basically one, one uh, French battalion basically set a trap and really hurt those guys very, very badly um, and probably continue to hurt them very, very badly because they've just got nowhere to go and, and not enough coverage. The fact that the British don't have any native allies uh, in this scenario makes it really hard for them to traverse that wilderness terrain without the militia to sort of provide some defense factors for ambush. And then, uh, you know, Church, but, you know, Church is a Swiss army knife, but he can only be in one place at once, uh, which makes him hard to to leverage, you know, everywhere you would want him to. So, yeah, the the, the campaign felt, you know, somewhat balanced. I think if the French had been able to keep their uh, automatic leader in for longer, um, wherever he got off to, I think I just lost track of the counter, um, somewhere, uh, I have him, um, you know, if we had retained control of him for longer, he may have had a much greater effect over the course of the campaign, but it just didn't come to pass, so, yeah, there you go, guys, Queen Anne's War from 1702 to 1712, a British victory, just just barely getting a victory and not a draw with the French. Uh, the next scenario that I'll play uh, with this game will be King George's War, which occurs during the 1740s. 
and aligns, uh, I think, with the War of Austrian Succession, if I'm not mistaken, um, and will be uh, interesting because that is actually a scenario from the base game, which means we won't be messing around with these little bingo chits uh, anymore, and the map will reflect a lot more of what the normal game looks like, but it still won't be the number of units and stuff going on as the French and Indian War, or even the, uh, the American Revolution, which is heavy, heavy on units. So hope you guys enjoyed this video. I uh, hope it was somewhat interesting to you. It's, uh, it's an interesting scenario to me. I think a lot of people look at this one in King William's War as kind of dull affairs, but I think, you know, the, the adverse is other scenarios in the main game tend to do a lot more units and a lot more happens per turn um, because basically just the more units, the more likely you are to activate something and take some action. Here it's the inverse. You have a lot of turns, but very few units that eventually across a year, you're going to activate somebody and something's going to happen. And to be honest, these wars were much slower paced than the others. So to me, um, it all kind of matches expectations. I'm not put off by that. I thought these were interesting puzzles of scenarios to play through. So yeah, hope you enjoyed. We'll see you in the next one, guys. Take care. Thanks for watching. Keep gaming.